Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Russ, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Hal Cranmer is a returning guest on our show. Be absolutely sure to check out his first appearance on episode 415 of Boundless Body Radio, which was, no joke, one of my absolute favorite episodes we've ever recorded on the show. Hal Cranmer is the owner of A Paradise for Parents, which includes four assisted living homes in Phoenix, Arizona. They are having incredible success by implementing low-carbohydrate and carnivore diets, along with engaging exercise programs with their elderly patients. They have several programs that they successfully manage, including a bariatric program to help people lose weight and a program to greatly diminish and even reverse the effects of dementia, Alzheimer's, and other cognitive diseases. Their assisted living homes improve the health of their residents through changes in lifestyle. They employ doctors, personal trainers, and nutritionists who design meal programs prepared from scratch. The assigned activities program keeps their residents engaged socially and mentally. Several residents from their homes have become well enough to go back to living at home again. Others have moved from bed to wheelchairs, from wheelchairs to walkers, and from walkers to walking by themselves. You can find Hal on Twitter at Hal Cranmer. Cranmer excuse me. Hal Cranmer, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Boundless Body Radio. It's a pleasure to be here, Casey. You're one of my favorite podcast hosts in the podcast universe. Oh, man. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Through you, we've been able to meet one of your managers who made a surprise appearance on our last <laughs> uh, episode. I believe her name was Aurora. She was amazing. Got to chat with her, um, learn her story. We also hosted um, Daniel Magyar, which is somebody that you've employed um, to do virtual exercise coaching. Um, he was episode 425. He was amazing to chat with, a wonderful person that, that knows so much about carnivore diet, nutrition, and about strength training. We've also been able to talk to one of your residents, or I should say at this point, former residents, Julie Sykes, and that was episode 435. She's now gone, right? She's, She's moved gone to like own. an independent living arrangement, wow. like an apartment building. And yeah, wow. doing well, as far as I know. That's amazing. Well, I'm so excited to catch up with you and see how things have gone since our first conversation. Um, it has been a minute, um, so it'll be nice to hear your story again, which we'll get to in just a second. But um, really cool to say that we got to meet in person in the meantime, between the last episode and this episode, just a few sure months did. ago. Yeah, so awesome. At the Symposium for Metabolic Health in San Diego, I, I, I saw you from across the room. As soon as I saw you, I'm like, I know exactly who that is. Marched right over there to go say hi to you. Um, now, as I understand, this is the first low-carbohydrate conference you've ever been to, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. So how how did you find it? What did you think? Um, was, it, was it a good time? Like, what did you think of the conference itself? I loved it. Um, I thought there were some great presentations. It, it's nice to be with some like-minded people. A lot of people in really good shape, obviously doing well on the diet. Um, and and just to mix ideas and, and get connections and, and new ideas that I could put in my assisted living home was fantastic. I, it was my first conference doing that. I'm looking forward to going to many more. That's amazing. And so that was your there. <laughs> and I will be there. <laughs> you better believe I will be there. I made the point oftentimes, like that trip that we went to San Diego, I didn't even go to the beach. Like you're there in a hotel conference room, not the most ideal place that I would love to spend my entire weekend away from clients, but it's just the energy and the talks and what you learn, like it makes it worth it. Like that to me feels like a vacation and to meet so many people out in the space is just is just wonderful. Do you have any like standouts that people like you really wanted to meet? You got to actually meet them and talk to them. Oh, well, Dr. Anthony Chafee was a big one for me. Um, I loved in the one of his Q and A sessions. Someone asked him if you could design the perfect supplement, what would you put in it? <laughs> he said steak. Um, <laughs> he he's a big hero of mine. Um, that Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. Um, I've heard him on a bunch of other podcasts and to meet him in person was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I think he's doing some amazing work. I mean, he was even like on the Tim Ferriss and those kind of podcasts, nothing against yours, but those are like Joe Rogan level and they invite him on regularly. So it was neat to see him. And what I really liked was uh, a lot of the doctors there put their presentations into a perspective of a story or a, you know, this explorer went and lived with the Eskimos. We can't, I don't know if you can call them Eskimos anymore, um, <laughs> for like two years and ate nothing but whale blubber and walrus meat and caribou and 
and they felt amazing and you know had nothing wrong with them and cured all their chronic symptoms of anything and uh you know those are the kind of stories i can bring back rather than go and you know your atp transport chain and this cell nucleus does energize mitochondria all this scientific garbage it's not garbage but jargon um you know i i'm talking to families with a mother on dementia or father who has parkinson's they don't want to hear all that they want to know are you going to treat my parent well and and when i can tell them you know these stories of people really doing well on these kind of diets it really makes them much more interested so much more helpful and yeah hearing those stories of people using this diet in the past you know, if I hadn't been in the space and, you know, been really interested in nutrition and gotten certified and all of this stuff, I would probably think the same thing that most other people out there think, like keto, carnivore, fad, fad, fad. All of these are fad diets. They are going to cause problems or people can't stick to them or maybe you'll lose some weight in the first few weeks, but you're going to regain it all back. And I understand people for thinking that when you're talking about some of these stories and understanding that people have lived this way for hundreds of thousands of millions of years eating those types of foods and thinking logically, like that's probably all the food they would have had available to begin with. Like you start to understand that, oh, this is just the way that we are supposed to live as humans. Is that species appropriate diet that Dr. Chafee talks about all the time. He's, he's, he's bringing those type, that type of information out so that we can better understand it. Right. And, and you see those, you know, the old fossil record or whatever, or you see paintings of these people and stuff. You don't see any fat people. Yeah, you don't see people like laying in bed unless they got gored by a woolly mammoth or you know saber tooth tiger or whatever it is. Yeah, you know they they were running around being fit, doing great, and it wasn't you know all these diseases that people get these days are modern diseases. Yeah, you know yeah the, people didn't have the big problems back then. Yeah, as far yeah. as I can tell. Yeah, as far as I can tell as well, that's the case. And you mentioned something very interesting, and I totally agree. You go to these conferences, you see many people that are um, really, really fit. Dr. Chakey, great example. Like, he definitely practices what he preaches. That dude is shredded and tan, and his skin glows. Like, he, he looks great. He's awesome. <laughs> My yeah, wife. I, I have a personal physician that's diabetic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we We just don't discuss food or anything we just go through the you know nice guy and everything but i'm like you know you doctors to me should be the healthiest people in the world because yeah. they have the access to the best information of how to stay healthy and i see so many of them take some of my residents when they go to the hospital i'll go visit them and i'm looking around at all the nurses and doctors there and i'm like dudes put down the donuts <laughs> Totally, totally. And they, they don't know. They do the best they can. Um, my wife yeah. was following Dr. Chafee on Instagram and she asked me one day, like, hey, is he as good looking in person as he is on like Instagram? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. He looks way better in person than he does on Instagram. He's yeah. a freak. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so we have those type of people. <laughs> exactly. We have those people that go to these conferences and I've, I've gone to a few. I'll, I'll give three quick examples where I, I would arrive at my very first one and I see people that aren't in that really good shape. You can tell like they're probably not following the advice. Clearly something's up. And, you know, my, my very first one, I sit down, it's it's a doctor of some kind, but I found out for the, to, through talking to him that he's retired and he just learned about this stuff like three months ago. So he's got weight to lose, but like he's, he's there, you know, like learning all this stuff and and thinking back on his career like i can't believe i was not teaching some of this stuff another yeah. dude this year at low carb denver he's a bigger guy he sat down for a quick conversation with me and found out he's just a resident of denver that had a heart attack last year and he's on a weight loss journey through listening to people like dr ken berry and he's just there because same thing he wants to learn you know, more about this. And you'd look at him and say, he's not metabolically healthy, but he's already lost so much weight. He's there to continue his journey. In the same time, same thing at, at San Diego, met a woman, 50 pounds overweight, but she's already lost 120 through fasting. And she's there because she wants to learn. And so it, it's cool to think that not only are you going to see the Uber fit people, but you're also going to see people that are on their own journeys, wherever that is. It's so inspirational to me. Like yeah. you see all these bad diets and you see all this, you know, take, ozempic to lose weight or 
all these medications that uh, are supposed to help you for all kinds of chronic diseases. Well, they don't. They might make your pain go away or something like that, but you don't see long-term success. And and it's not just, you know, that this diet helps you lose 80 or 100 pounds. It's It changed your life. Like, I'm never going to go back to that. And I hear that so many times from people. And you think, oh, my God, you know, this is something that's really sustainable and really effective. And it it's not going to be a short term thing. It's going to be the rest of your life. And, and you're going to have a much better life because of it. Yeah, it will also get easier over time. The more you do it, the easier it gets. It is very convenient and not very expensive. Um, and that's a good segue into the right. current and, state and of this. And, and me being a really bad cook, I can cook this all day long and do fine. <laughs> Just eat up some burger patties, throw some eggs in a pan. Yeah. It's not that hard. I could salt a steak. <laughs> there, you go. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Well, that's amazing. Well, this would be a good chance to kind of get an update of your own health state of the state for you personally. Um, this is an honest question. Uh, you look great. You told us last time you were eating a, a carnivore diet or something adjacent to a carnivore diet. I consider anything, you know, 75% plus of your calories coming from animal products as the, carn the, the carnivore diet. Um, but let's get an update from you. And again, honest update. I have no idea what you've been doing. Has your eating changed? Has all the, the meat built up in your arteries and is blowing up your heart? Like, how, how are you doing? No, I uh, I went to that doctor, my diabetic doctor, uh, a couple months ago, and all the tests were just phenomenal. They're, uh, you know, my triglycerides, I think, were 37. Um, wow, and, super low. Yeah, I, uh, my A1C was, like, under 5. I feel amazing. Um, I... I can, I go, went to the climbing gym with my son. He's, he's better at it than me, definitely. But I held my own and could, you know, do these rock wall climbing, never done it before or, or done some very minimal ones before. Um, you know, I hike up mountains around here in Phoenix and have no problem doing that. It's, uh, it feels really, really amazing. I go windsurfing for two hours at the local lake and I couldn't do that when I was like 35 yeah <laughs> I'm 56 and just loving life it's, <laughs> it's wonder and and I just it, what's neat about it too is when you feel this way and you realize how good it, it makes you feel you start becoming a, a evangelizer you know you go out and and spread the word you want to tell other people about it not just you know in my old folks home or something but all of my friends, family, everyone like that, I, I'm i like, get on this. I want you around forever and be my <laughs> friend, be my relative, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that is exactly how it goes. Your results are so consistent with what we hear in this community. It's almost like expected at this point. If you start this enough to start experiencing the benefits, you're probably going to want to continue doing that. And then all the things that you said are, come true. Like I'm turning 40 in a few months. I feel way better now than I did at 30. Way better. No comparison whatsoever. And it, you mentioned the evangelizing part, which I love. So with your doctor in particular, as he's giving you these results, did you spark any kind of like curiosity? What did he want to know? Like he probably doesn't see oh. many 56 year olds that are in your shape and don't have medication. Did he, did he care? No, in fact, um, I I think I talked to you last time about the work we're doing with a company called Mind for All Seasons that helps us with our dementia residents. Yeah. So they they suggested I go get the blood work and just you know make sure I'm not like headed the dementia route or anything, and I, so I brought the list of blood tests that I need to have for my doctor, and he's an older guy, and he looked at it and he goes you know, these young doctors just want to test for everything. And he like threw the list aside. So I'll give you the tests that you, you should be taking. I mean, that's where I got my triglycerides and everything resolved. But I'm like, I was trying to explain, no, it's, it's not like that. These guys are dementia specialists. I'm just checking. And he's like, you don't need that. And so <laughs> I, I'm like, it's, I, I just don't think it's necessarily, I could tell he didn't want to know, like, He's he's probably been practicing medicine 30, 40 years and set in his ways. And it's like, 
I mean, he's a nice guy and I get my tests and he's right down the street. But so I figured I'll just keep going to him for a checkup, but he's, I'm not going to convince him. I can tell right now. Yeah. And it's too bad. It's too bad that you see that apathy out there. I, I would I would almost rather have somebody want to know about it and then disagree with everything I'm saying versus just like I don't I don't care. I don't want to know. Although I can understand it because like the you know, the work of Nina Teichels came into my field division about the same time that she released her book in 2014. Somebody sent me an article and I knew the book existed, but I didn't actually read it according to my like Facebook fine hop thing, whatever, until 2016. So that's two years. And if, wow. if I think back, if I think back, I, I'm thinking like, okay. If, if what she's saying is right, then everything I've been taught is wrong. And so I kind of had a bit of resistance. And I wonder if, if doctors experience that as well. Like if, if all these people are getting a lot better and don't need me anymore, maybe I don't want to know about it. Yeah. There's some kind of saying that goes along with that. It's it's very hard to convince someone's wrong about something if their livelihood depends on it. Something yeah, like good. <laughs> good point. That's, that's a really good point. That's true. Well, I, mean, I definitely personally, recommend. Personally, oh, I want to get. I, I want the assisted living industry to go away. I mean, yes, I make money from it, but I would, I would love to be able to transition into something else because everyone's too healthy to have assisted living anymore. Yeah, but absolutely. A lot of people don't feel that way about their industries. That's right. No, and and unfortunately for you and that idea, I think you're going to be in business for a very, very long time. Um, and that's a great yeah, I'm segue. Not <laughs> That's a great segue. We advocate all I want and be still yeah, be perfect. fine. <laughs> perfect. Um, we we told the listener episode four fifteen. You have to go listen to it. We told your full story there and how you got into this. But you know, just as a brief kind of reminder, we tell our listeners how you got into assisted care living because that wasn't necessarily what you were ever really trained in, and neither was like the medical or nutrition world. This is all kind of relatively new to you. No, I was. Yeah, I started. My working career is an Air Force pilot. I flew C-130s mostly um, for the Air Force Special Ops Command. Flew a lot of all those neat SEALs and Green Berets and all those kind of people and dropped them into some of the worst places on Earth. Um, and I, uh, I ate like crap then. <laughs> you know, I was an Air Force pi military pilot. You get down and you have a beer with your debrief and then you go out you know, we'd fly at night almost all the time. And so at three in the morning, I'd go out with a buddy to an all night restaurant at Denny's or a Waffle House, and we'd have some fried chicken and fries. And, you know, I'm not going to just go home and fall asleep. Or I'd have a bowl of cereal when I got home before I went to bed, all that kind of stuff. Um, then, uh, yeah, I went to the airlines, flew for a company called US Air for a couple of years. And then 9-11 happened. I lost my job as US Air was about to go bankrupt. And then uh, went into manufacturing for like 20 years, um, or not 20 years, um, maybe 15, and uh, rose up to be a plant manager of a big machining shop. And then um, the Alcoa bought our machining shop and canned all the management, <laughs> so wanted to put theirs in. So I, I'd been flipping some houses and buying rental properties on the side um, in Minnesota, and we... Uh, Another investor told me about assisted living as an investment. And so I looked into it. We really wanted to move to Phoenix. I went to flight school down here in the Air Force when I first started out. And um, my kids were going to ASU. So we went through the course. I really liked what I heard and jumped in. Um, that was in 2016. And I didn't, there was nothing about nutrition back then. I mean, I was trying to eat healthy, but I wasn't big into it at all. Um, but then when I got the assisted living homes, I looked at around at a lot of the assisted living facilities around Phoenix and went, you know, met a lot of people at them, toured them, so trying to learn how to do this business. And um, I was kind of grossed out by what I saw. A lot of people laying around watching TV, a lot of residents with 20, 30 medications they were taking. Uh, that were just kind of comatose or very, not really full of life or anything like that. What you typically expect of a nursing home and, the, you know, not a fault of the assisted living that a lot of people wait till the last minute, you know, when they're really, really sick to go into assisted living. And, you know, the, the state 
requires us to follow all the doctor's orders for medications and everything like that. So they were doing what they thought was the right thing to do. Uh, it just seemed like we could do so much more for them. So I started, so I started reading about it. Uh, I actually went through a, a vegan phase. That was the first thing that caught my attention. And so I hired some vegan nutritionists and they were, they were making recipes that I had to drive all over town to try to find some of the ingredients for that were just really weird and I'd ever heard of. And so we made it and I started having a, I, we did it for a couple months and I had a big revolt on my hands that they, uh, my people were threatening to move out. They wanted eggs. They wanted a hamburger, occasionally a steak. So, um, and, and I wasn't seeing a whole lot of progress with anyone. No one was like, oh my gosh, this is working. Look, you know, so um, I fired those nutritionists and I just kept looking. And then I got, um, I like to work out. So I got a exercise system called an X3 that is uh, made by a entrepreneur sort of biomechanics expert. And he, along with this exercise thing, was a big advocate of the carnivore diet. So um, I looked into it and I personally, I started doing the carnivore diet. That was about two, two and a half years ago. And I was like, wow, I feel fantastic. <laughs> this is great. Um, I also was looking at the time with a, a Dr. Dale Bredesen in California who uh, had just developed this thing called the Bredesen Protocol, and he'd actually reversed dementia and Alzheimer's with a whole bunch of people, several thousand. Um, there's a lot of caveats to it. You got to catch it early. You've got to stick with it. You know, like keto or carnivore, it's a lifestyle change, but it heavily emphasizes a ketogenic diet. So um, all that sort of came together to say, we should do a keto or carnivore diet in assisted living homes. And it's a little slow on the uptake, but we're making progress. That's absolutely amazing. I am going to steal a line that I've stolen several times since we did the interview with him. Daniel Magyar, we have already mentioned, you've used him in the past. I'm not sure if you currently are, but you've used him in the we past. We currently are, yes. Great. With great success. He does a wonderful job. And he yeah. said something that I love. And again, I've stolen it many times. He said, if you don't think a carnivore diet sounds weird when you first hear about it, then I think you're weird. Like that itself <laughs> is weird. And I'm like, dude, that's that's very well said. What was your reaction when you hear this dude? He's ripped. So he's using exercise, obviously, to get ripped. But then he's also talking about never eating vegetables and only eating meat and eggs. Like, did, did you think it was pretty weird the first time you heard about it? Yeah, I thought it was crazy because I, um, when I was going through that vegan phase, I had a, a trainer that was exercising my residence. And he was an ex-football player in really good shape. And he was vegetarian. And he was telling me all about how meat is uh, classified by the World Health Organization as a class one carcinogen or something like that. that causes cancer. And, I, and I'm, so when they said they eat nothing but meat, I'm like, that's, you know, I, I could accept eating meat. I've eaten meat my whole life, but really nothing but meat. What about veggies? What about fiber? What about nutrients, fruit, you know, vitamin, what about vitamin C scurvy? There were all these questions that would come up and they still come up with my residents. Wow. So it's, yeah, at least I'm not, at least you don't think I'm weird now, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not now. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, I was, and then when I read it in that guy's book, and he's like fasting and meat, and then you know eggs and stuff like that, I'm like, this is crazy. Cholesterol, another question, you know. Yeah, all of those. yeah, totally. And you know, once you are into the carnival world and you hear the different arguments, you realize that you know the arguments on both sides. We have a lot more in common than we do differences. But vegans and and you know, carnivores. If you're doing it the right way, you want to eliminate a lot of ultra processed foods. So I generally think we can make a lot more bridges than we need to make, um, you know, walls and, and separations between us. But like you do recognize once you get over to the carnivore side, like oh, when these guys are talking about all of those things, the fiber, the cholesterol, the the carcinogenic nature of meat, like when carnivores talk about it, it is science and facts and studies and and they tell you what we know and what we don't know and with the other side 
it's convincing for sure, but it's much more emotion. Everybody knows that vegetables are better for you. There's not a lot of facts. It's just like, this is working for me. The, the studies they cite are horrible as far as data collection or the actual you know numbers don't even make sense statistically. So after a while, it, you, you understand the difference between the two. But initially, yeah, vegan sounds amazing for many different reasons. Right. It's it's what we're grown up with. I mean, my mom would say, finish your vegetables. She never said, yep. finish your meat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we want you to grow big and strong. So you got to eat vegetables, too. <laughs> yep. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, what what kind of that that guy who invented the X3, um, it, he has a book about how to work out, how to eat, everything like that. And one thing that impressed me was hey, I'm, I'm doing a ton of research and I came at this with an open mind. If if I could see all the studies that showed veganism or whatever diet was right, I would recommend that. I'm not like this big fan of meat that wants to do this. And then in his Facebook group that I stay in, which where's where I met Daniel, um, it was, you know, everyone would bring up an objection and he put like three or four studies of saying, here's why that's wrong. Like yeah. for dementia, for the ketogenic diet with Dr. Bredesen, I mean, the guy's brilliant, but he he emphasizes lots of veggies and lots of colored veggies that are low carb um, and have meat some, but not a lot more fish kind of stuff. And he says the reason he does that is because of glu gluconeogenesis. Does that sound right? Yeah, nice job. Big word. Where your meat, where if you eat a lot of meat, I think it's your liver or some organ starts converting it into carbs. Well, this guy, John Jakish, who invented the X3, showed studies that it only does that in extreme carb deficit in your body. And it only makes enough that you get to the very bare minimum of carbs. You don't, it's not like, you know, you just ate Captain Crunch followed by lasagna it's you know kind of carb levels it's you know this is the bare minimum stuff you need and it's not because carbs are harmful to your brain and that's why dale bredesen says you know don't eat a lot of meat because your body's going to make it into carbs well it doesn't really yeah that's so, right but and, and there are studies that show that and i when i read dale bredesen's book it didn't have a study that you know said how many carbs it makes yeah so. no it's it's super interesting that the gluconeogenesis when you fat adapt is a completely different context if you're living on carbohydrates like you said the captain crunch and lasagna like you need such a high amount of carbohydrates because your body is burning such a high amount of carbohydrates and so yeah right. in that context any protein you eat might be converted into carbohydrates if you don't have enough which is easy because you don't store very many but when you don't when you're not using carbohydrates anymore, you should, your body converts to fat. Well, the amount of sugar that you need is so minuscule. Your body can just make that exact right enough amount all the time. It's why you can go climb mountains. You can go windsurf for two hours. It's why I could, you know, jump on my mountain bike or road bike and go ride for a few hours. And I don't, I, you don't need to eat. You don't need to bring a bottle. Like you feel fine. And your body right. is just churning out exactly the right amount that it needs. Yeah. I don't know if you saw, there was an article about a guy who just, broke the record for climbing like El Capitan or one of those big mountains. It took him four and a half hours of climbing a vertical rock face and he didn't bring any water or food with him to do it. Amazing. Like, didn't even need a sip of water in four and a half hours of climbing a vertical rock. It's just, <laughs> that tells you how good this diet is. And it's the article so awesome. said he based it on his strange diet of meat, salt, and water. <laughs> Pretty, pretty strange stuff out there. That's amazing. Yeah. It's well, it's funny to it is. Oh, go ahead. It is strange if like you said, if you don't if you never heard of it before, but good point. More and yeah. more people are hearing of it. That's a good point. Um, I think about your your dinner as a childhood where you're told to finish your breakfast, your uh, vegetables. You probably went after dinner and watched Popeye eat cans and cans of spinach on TV in the cartoon, and he's probably having kidney stones and a big oxalate dump these days. Yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> Poor guy. Okay, so I wanted to clarify something from last time. And you, you kind of sort of answered my question, but I just want to re-hit on this. When you started your business, you had toured around and seen assisted living facilities, but you, I mean, you didn't want to 
abuse, you know, the people there, but you, you also were getting into this more for the business side of things. than it was like, I want to transform the health of people in a really bad way. Um, health wise, I, again, like I said, like if that happened, that's great. I know you're not trying to like hurt people, but it also wasn't necessarily your main goal to be like, we're going to transform health. This is a business idea. Yeah, I got it. I mean, I was running rental properties when another investor told me about assisted living and I, um, he, he basically said, you know, your tenants won't have keg parties and kick in walls. I mean, I was mostly renting to students at the University of Minnesota. So I was like, that sounds good. And, you know, when you run rental properties, you put people in there, you check on them once a month or so, and, you know, answer maintenance calls, and otherwise you leave them alone. So I was hoping this investment would be kind of we'd move down here and I'd have plenty of free time to spend my family and, you know, money would roll in kind of thing. And all I had to do was make sure they're filled and then have a staff to run it. Um, but I, I just, yes, they do run them that way. I don't want to say that facilities abuse residents because that does happen and it's horrible. And I, we have a terrible reputation among nursing homes and assisted living facilities for that. I would say it's more neglect or it's it's sort of acceptance of the status quo, right? I I own an assisted living facility. I have these residents in here. I'm going to make sure they're fed and cleaned, you know, and get to see their families. But the real health of them is really turned over to doctors or hospice or uh what physical therapists, that kind of thing. Um, so, and and what do doctors do? They come in, you know, like any doctor visit, you get a li list of your maladies and what hurts and what's wrong. And then they write a bunch of prescriptions and they leave. Okay. And there's not, especially with old people, there's not really like education of, hey, you should exercise or, hey, you should eat better or and even if you eat better a lot of the doctors are you know same as us when we were kids eat your veggies <laughs> or, or you know an apple a day keeps the doctor away kind of thing so um i wasn't seeing any improvement you know and i guess from my manufacturing background a lot of manufacturing there are these concepts called lean manufacturings or six sigma processes or they're there's people in charge in any manufacturing plant or good one of continuous improvement, they call it. Never be satisfied with the status quo. Always improve processes. Find a way to make that product less expensive or faster or better, like it has more features or whatever. You can't just go, okay, we make this widget. We're just going to sell it for the next 50 years because someone is going to make a better widget. And so you have there's a constant race. Well, I didn't feel that in assisted living. It's, it's you know, we just take care of them and we just let them be until they pass away. Yeah. And so there was no incentive. I mean, I don't want to say people, there's no one that wants to make it better, but there was not a big drive to what can we do that's better than what we were doing before. Because it's sort of, we're just providing housing and food and, you know, what's yeah. the big deal? Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to bring that up. It's a, such a special part of your story that you didn't necessarily get into this business for those reasons no. to help these people improve. But like going there and seeing these people, obviously, made, it, it was not comfortable for you enough to the point that you were looking for anything to help them. Right. But yeah, I, I remember when my mom was taking care of my grandmother, We she lived in Chicago, we got to Chicago a bunch. And um, she had dementia and she had a bunch of issues. And you could tell, like, you felt helpless. Like, all we're going to do is just watch her decline, you know, and try to spend time with her. And, and I just, I always thought, man, it'd be really nice if Nana could come back or could get better. And you just, I think it's it's easy to accept that, you know, they're 80 years old, 90 years old. This is the end of their life. Let them be. You know, but but I have people who are in their 60s, 70s. You know, there's a potential for 30 more years of life. A, 
a third, 50% more than they're currently getting. And, you know, you don't want to spend that with tubes coming out of you or laying on a couch every day or laying in your bed, just watching TV. So yeah, yeah there's a 98 year old on hospice that, you know, gets wheeled into my home and I'm really not going to be able to do much for, but there's also a 75 year old, you know, with beginning stages, Parkinson's or something like that, that you're like, we could do a lot for you. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the 98 year old you told us about last time that was able to go on a cruise with their family. Right. Amazing special memories, not just for that person, but the entire family. I, I got a call the other day from a family. I should follow up with them. Their mom's 105 and she's not happy with the assisted living she's in. And she, she just stopped driving at 103. Wow. So it's, it's possible. And I bet they weren't doing anything. I mean, I'm sure genetics play somewhat of a role in it, but you're like, you know, there is, you, you got to look at those outliers. People can do this. And what we should be doing is studying how did they do that and then replicating it with the rest of the population. Yeah, totally. And I, again, with your story, it's so interesting because you're learning about these things and the carnivore diet, low carbohydrate, ketogenic, you're learning about the Bredesen profile you're changing your own health and, and you're learning to start to integrate this you said with mixed result obviously you're not forcing anybody to eat any certain thing it's just kind of more like what 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 food is mostly available in some of your homes with few exceptions but what have been some of the sticking points what have been some of the hardest challenges you've come across as far as adaptation for this kind of like way of living uh there's been a couple and there still are so um I do get a lot of people who say, you know, my mom's 85, just let her be. She really likes her ice cream. And I say, okay, fair enough. Um, I get, uh, I get a lot of people, like I made a video with that uh, chef Maria Emmerich that writes a bunch of cooking books. And I, it was just like a 10 minute thing of her saying, you know, the keto diet works really well. I got tons of testimonials from my cookbooks and that kind of thing. And I put that out and I got families calling me saying that the ketogenic diet is only for special treatments like epilepsy. They're worried their mom's going to be uh, anorexic because she's going to lose too much weight on it. Um, they're worried that, you know, that they need carbs. Um, I see a lot of... Um, residents who are kind of addicted to sugar or carbs or something like that it's very hard for them to withdraw from that and um lose those cravings but the ones that do um make big improvements um i also have trouble with caregivers um i have some wonderful caregivers that have been with me a really long time but they think that they're being nice to the residents by giving them treats and you know or they'll they don't like they'll i i try to say you know let's at least do ketogenic i'd really like to do the carnivore the carnivore is a really hard sell these old people are like i don't want to eat just meat i want a salad i want a veggie i want some fruit um if you're not gonna let me have dessert so um I think, you know, so they'll go to the store and get keto chocolate chip cookies and think, hey, look, I did good. I got keto chocolate chip cookies. And I, I'm trying to convince them that's, uh, yeah, it says keto, but that's more a marketing gimmick than a, you know. <laughs> we, and I tell them, you know, if you're a young person at 35 that just want to improve your health and you've got, you know, pretty big sweet tooth, those are probably wonderful to transition on or figure it out. But when you're 80 and you've got dementia and you got Parkinson's and you got all these problems, we got to go a little hardcore, <laughs> you know, a gradual thing with keto donuts and keto ice cream and keto cookies. We're running out of time. <laughs> we got to, yeah. we got to work on this a little harder, but, um, so the caregivers, it, it's slow coming around and I have to like open up the pantry when I come over and go, what's this? <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> And they're, oh, well, they really wanted it, or it's their birthday, you know, or something like that. And we do cheat on holidays and birthdays, but it's, um, 
there are definitely a lot of obstacles. Exercise, we've taught the care. One of my caregivers who has like seven kids and three grandkids has learned, you know, she's very persuasive, <laughs> has learned you don't ask them, would you like to exercise today? You go, it's exercise time. Mm. And we them out all together. We all exercise together with some peer pressure because everyone's like, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> tomorrow never comes. So um, that's a little, little bit of a challenge. Um, some of the interventions we're doing, like we have, uh, I just put a sauna in one of my homes, um, just like some of the people just trying to maneuver them, get them into the sauna and everything can be a little challenging. And then sitting there, especially if they have dementia, they're like, it's hot in here. So they start getting <laughs> up to, you know, get out of it to get, I need to get cooler kind of thing. Doesn't realize mm. it's a sauna thing. So, um, you know, it is a little bit like herding cats, but um, once they see it, once they try it, and especially the keto, we uh, we hired some cooks since the last time we talked because we were having the caregivers prepare it. And what I was finding is, you know, after a caregiver goes the whole day of changing bathing, dressing, cooking, all this stuff, they they start thinking, you know, serving a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for dinner is probably <clears throat> really sounds good to me right now because I'm pretty tired. So I got these cooks that took that away from the caregivers and they come in and cook the meals. And um, so they're getting a good keto meal every meal, except breakfast. My caregivers make some eggs, bacon, sausage, things like that for breakfast. Um and that's helped a lot because these cooks make very delicious meals that are also ketogenic. And um, and so people are eating it. And, and people who weren't eating are starting to eat because of those. So, Yeah. I mean, those are breakfast foods. That would be really easy to transition to and just forget that you don't have toast one day or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that, that is right. pretty easy to start. Are you noticing that at even even at the ages of people you're dealing with, if they're having that kind of breakfast, are they, are they like kind of fasting through lunch or some of them like skipping meals because they're feeling so full and satiated that they're just simply like not that hungry? Yeah. Well, we try to have dinner at uh, four to four 30 so that they don't. And then the kitchen's closed until eight the next morning. So we try to fast them 15, 16 hours a day. So they stay reasonably hungry through the three meals of the day. I haven't convinced the health authority that we could go down to two meals a day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, but they do stay hungry. But what I'm, I'm seeing more of is like, I have a lady who's in her nineties and she came to us and would hardly eat anything. She was, she was tiny, really thin. And um, when we tried to feed her, we'd actually try to feed her like with assistance. And she would just chew it a little and then spit out whatever she ate. Well, we these got these cooks who make great ketogenic meals. And over time, she started eating them. And now she's asking for seconds. So it actually increased her appetite. And she gained 10 pounds, which she really needed to do. So it's, it's not like a ketogenic diet. It's wonderful for weight loss if you need it. But if you need weight gain, it, it helps you gain weight too. It kind of keeps you at the healthy level. Yeah, getting that protein intake correct at, at those ages is so, so critical, um, you know, to build up your bones and your muscles. Most most people think protein, they think muscle mass. They don't think about all the other things that come along with that, especially as we age and become more anabolic resistant. It's so important to get protein into people. So that's wonderful news. It's really cool that diet does seem to kind of level people out regardless of what they need, whether they, you know, have eating disorders and need to heal and gain weight or whether they're 400 pounds or pre-diabetic and need to lose weight. You seem to get kind of the same kind of results either way. Um, look, we mentioned Aurora last time she came on the show. Um, she said that, you know, it, she was really inspired. Her job satisfaction was much higher because people were doing better. She said that for her, her own journey, um, she knew that it worked really well for her. So I'm going to ask, generally speaking, with, with the rest of the staff, has any of the other staff members, like, seen the results, eating the same food, uh, feeling way better, maybe they lost weight? Like, are you noticing that people just by the nature of it are also trying the diet and feeling like you and seeing some of the, the results that you're seeing with your patients? Yeah, um, one of my managers has cancer and he is, uh, he's doing the ketogenic diet and it's helping his cancer. The, the tumor is shrunk actually, Good. Uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, Aurora, 
her son voluntarily went on it. He's lost about 70 pounds. Um, and he's now in intermittent fasting and she's like, you created a monster, <laughs> so, but great. he's doing great. Like acne's clearing up on his face and uh, he's a teenager, all that kind of stuff. Um, my, one of my cooks who said she tried keto for a while when I interviewed her, um, and she said, but I just, I couldn't overcome my resistance to carbs has now gone back on it and it's starting to lose weight and feeling much better. So um, it's some of the staff are doing it. Some of them aren't, um, but I, but they're all agreeing that it's helping our residents a lot. Um, mm. Aurora's house, we went over a year and a half without losing a resident and wow. that includes residents that were on hospice. So um, wow. in fact, we have one hospice company tell us, I don't want to bring any more residents to your house because you get them off our service. <laughs> they get too healthy and we have to like discharge them from hospice and we lose money. <laughs> That's amazing. I would tell every potential resident of, of your facility that when they come in and tell that to their families. Like we're Oh, I protected. tell some of them. If it comes up in conversation, I tell them. I mean, the hospice <laughs> lady was joking, but she was she's like, would you stop taking them off hospice? <laughs> So, so uh, I took that is a huge compliment the other nice compliment i got when the department of health they come in and inspect our homes um at least annually uh just surprise inspections they come in check all our paperwork <laughs> and stuff and uh one of the inspectors who's a real stickler for paperwork said you know there's a there's at the end of the inspection she goes there's one or two things that you could definitely improve on your paperwork but man your residents are all incredibly healthy and walking around and it's so neat to see. And I'm like, yeah, maybe tell the other homes what we're doing. <laughs> so <laughs> that, it was nice amazing. to hear that from the Department of Health. That is absolutely amazing. I can definitely um, confirm that by following your Instagram and your Facebook, seeing the pictures from the 4th of July and like everybody's happy and dancing. And yeah, you might have a little bit of variation in the diet on a holiday or whatever, but you still have a massive grill with lots of burgers and everybody seems totally happy and and, and lots of smiles. So I yeah. absolutely love that. Um, now, I, last time we talked about your staff a little bit and, and you were mentioning uh, burnout being a really big thing. Like, yeah, you're going to get pretty burned out when you're basically probably working late hours. You're you're wiping up, you know, old people's bums like it's it's not the easiest job. And, and like we talked about last time, some people just have the gene for it, which is amazing. But I would venture to guess um, that you are retaining your staff much better than other facilities in your area. And I know you kind of keep tabs on what other places are doing. But would you say that's the case? Do you feel like you've got really good retention of your staff because everybody is feeling like they're contributing, people are healthy and happy, they maybe are getting really great results themselves? Like, have you noticed that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it it kind of gives it more of a purpose, you know, like an objective, like we're trying to get these guys better. And I've given them financial rewards for, for, try, for succeeding to get some people better too. Um, so I... I, a lot of my staff, I'd say half my staff have been with me since I bought the places in 2015 and 16. Wow. So when I tell families that the tour, they're like, wow, I, you know, I haven't heard about it, any other assisted living facility. And, and we also, because we're a home, our staff to resident ratio is a lot better. We have two staff members usually during the day, sometimes three if it's a busy day or we've got people with high levels of care and there's only 10 residents. So it's like a three to one to five to one ratio. In the big facilities, it can be 15 to one or 20 to one. Wow! Imagine taking care of 15 old people or 20 old people to one staff member. You can, I mean, no matter how good you diet and exercise, you're going to be burned out. You know, taking care of 15 to 20 Adults, your or my age, would be challenging. Now add in, they're all chronic health conditions and need changing and Hoyer lifts and, you know, might be a really overweight. So um, I think that's a lot where the burnout comes. But I think having a purpose and seeing people get better and having families come in and comp compliment them. Like, you know, I'll have families who... 
uh, resident passed away, um, like it, if they pass away, say in the middle of the month, I give them the rest of the month as a refund. A lot of the families are like, oh, give the money to my your staff members. They were fantastic. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, so the staff sort of has a big incentive of like, wow, this is cool. If we treat people really well, we'll get we'll get, make more money. And I've always told them, worry about the care. The money will come. Don't nickel and dime everything. Make this place a place that everyone is thrilled to put their mom or dad in and you'll see the money roll in. That's amazing. What a wonderful way to approach your business. So we kind of got a sense of that with um, the episode that we did with Julie Sipes. Um, that was episode 435. She's kind of bounced around different facilities. You know, she started her own kind of weight loss journey when she was 650 pounds in her early 30s. And, you know, through a bariatric surgery, she's able to lose a little bit of weight. But that was over the course of many years, about 100 pounds. By the time that we were talking to her, I, just, I couldn't even believe the numbers. It was like basically by doing carnivore and X3 bar workouts with her trainer, Daniel, she was losing about a pound a day. Like when we talked to her, she ended your facility at 550. She was already in her 380s, like six months later, like astounding, impossible weight loss, according to all of my non-carnivore nutrition certifications that I've ever done. You can't do that. And she literally did. And now she's yeah. in a place where she is is out, you know, more on her own. She's in a facility where she can get care if needed, but much more independence. Um, anything to kind of add on, on her story and her decision to kind of like, change your life and get out of there in less than a year. Yeah. Right. No, it's a fantastic story. I mean, she ended up, she was down about three thirty, um, at her lowest and, uh, she, you know, we were thrilled to get her out and, uh, put her in an independent facility and I'm hoping she continues and lives her life. But I think she learned a lot of good lessons at our place. And we've got another, a guy in here now. he, he went down about 50 pounds. He's a little slower on this because he's uh, it's hard for him to give up all the carbs, but we're getting there. So, uh, but his, his blood sugar dropped from average. He was very diabetic to very borderline diabetic now. So um, it's neat to see. And I hope we can continue that. That's absolutely amazing. One question I had for Julie as we were wrapping up our episode is like, okay, we know this is your goal. We think you're going to get there. Her, her target was summertime. It ended up being more of the fall time that she was able to do that. Amazing that she could do that. And, and I kind of told her, like, look, you're, you're going out into a world where basically you're a cocaine addict. You went to a rehab facility. You think you're not addicted to cocaine. You're going into a world where there is cocaine literally on every street corner. Like, are you worried? It's going to be tough out there. Like, it's not, it's not great. You can it's order, not the you best can order cocaine online. <laughs> They'll, they'll bring it to your house, whatever kind you like. You pick the type of cocaine, like whatever flavor you want. Like it's, it's absurd. Um, you, I mean, is it for somebody like that? Do you think it's going to be too much? I think it's going to be challenging. Yeah. I don't, uh, you know, I, you got to think of it as a lifestyle. We had discussions of, you know, don't think of food as, you know, a treat. Think of it as fuel. Like you don't put, bad gas in your car don't put bad food in your mouth yeah you know because it same effect as the car right yeah. and so it it's a question of changing mindset and hopefully she continues to realize that and and keeps moving forward the progress yeah. she made very hopeful for her. She's a wonderful person and love that she was so vulnerable and able to share her story with us. And so, yeah, we're wishing her the absolute best on her own. It's amazing that she was able to get there with her emotional support teddy bear, which she takes around with her everywhere. It's, oh, it's yeah. just awesome. It's so great. Um, okay. So you said, obviously, like the transition to, to fully convince somebody to do really call it like a more strict carnivore diet is challenging. Have you had cases where, yes, it was challenging, but you you were able to accomplish that so julie and the um the new guy we got in the weight loss is primarily the carnivore diets um the elderly and and julie was 42 this new guy's 37 so it's uh it's the younger crowd too the older one i'm just i, I kind of given up trying to get the carnivore diet through everyone's like well i, I do have um, one resident who's who's a younger guy too on it and, and 
um, actually two. One's lost 25 pounds and one's lost about 15 uh, just in the last couple months. But they, um, they're they they're okay with it. But I, I know they cheat. <laughs> I don't, um, they're not, they're not bariatric by any means. They just need to lose a little. And um, so the, the insurance that I get for people like Julie or this new guy um, won't cover Daniel's fee. So I've, I've hired Daniel just for like a one-time consultation with them. And he laid out the, the diet and then my caregivers are um, doing that, but he doesn't work with them weekly like he does with Julie and this other guy. Gotcha. Um, but the ketogenic diet still has had great results. And I'd, I'd love to talk about a story of a, a lady who just moved back home last week uh, to Washington state. Um, they came to us with, de with dementia and a couple other problems. And she just moved back completely. I mean, if you talk to her and we just did a podcast with Sean Baker with her on it, um, <laughs> you would never know that she had any health problems. She came to us walking with a cane, uh, overweight, been diagnosed with depression for the last 20 years. Um, what else? Her hands were shaking. She, she had like tremors in her hands to the point where she could barely write. Um, and she was diagnosed with dementia. And we gave her a cognitive test when she first moved in that showed she she scored in the dementia range of it. Um, we put her on a ketogenic diet. We gave her red light therapy. She did saunas every day. We did right after the sauna, we did a cold shower with her, which she hated, but she gritted her teeth through it. Um, we exercised her a ton and um, she does, no longer walks with a cane. She's dropped 30 pounds. Her depression is gone. Uh, she's off all her depression medications. And um, I gave her a test two months ago, um, and she tested in the mild cognitive impairment range, not the dementia range. And then I gave her a test. Oh, and we also did hyperbaric oxygen with her. And I uh, tested her a week ago, and she scored in the normal range of um, cognitive health. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh my so, goodness. Um, so like I said, she's living at home. She's actually talking about becoming a health coach for Maria Emmerich. Wow. And, yeah. And she may move back down to Phoenix because she's got a lot of family here. So um, she doesn't really have anyone left in Washington. So um, we're in discussions <laughs> and I'm like, I might use you for marketing and stuff too. But um, yeah, it, it's an amazing story and I'd love to give you her name and maybe put her on your, your boundless health radio too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is wonderful. I told you, I almost got emotional last time we were talking. I'm almost getting emotional. Yeah, now. This so, one will really make you emotional. Oh my goodness. So, okay. Yeah. We worked, this definitely... we worked with a, we worked with this company of mine for all seasons uh, that sort of led us through this, that has a whole bunch of medical experts that have found, they've been able to reverse cognitive decline in a lot of people. They work with a lot of, any kind of cognitive decline like they work with nfl players who have a lot of concussions and cognitive issues because of those or i think they work with some children uh with traumatic brain injuries and all that kind of stuff um so they when julie the the lady's name is or not julie i've got julie sipes melissa is the other lady's name when she came when she started with us um they gave her a whole lot of tests. I mean, they took 15 vials of blood and they make this 40 page report of everything that's wrong with you from inflammation markers to blood sugar, to vitamins, to hormones, to um, what else was on there? Um, genetic pathways, whether you, your methylation genes are working, all this stuff. And then they prescribe some supplements um, and then, you know, diet and all these other interventions as well. And they basically come up with a plan of this is how we're going to heal you. And then all those factors, we got to optimize it because what they're finding with dementia is um, it's not one thing. It's not just because you have plaques in your brain. Well, you have plaques in your brain because there's a bunch of stuff attacking your brain. And oh, another thing is uh, dental hygiene because 
if you gingivitis or periodontis, that bacteria migrates up to your brain and starts going after it. And you develop plaques in your brain to fight it. And that's what's killing your brain. Um, so we took her to the dentist. Sure enough, she had bad teeth. She's like, I haven't been to the dentist in years. Um, so they cleaned all that up, cleaned up the infection. That probably helped a bunch too. And, and what, you know, what I'm finding on this keto carnivore diet is if, even if, if you don't brush your teeth all that much, but you eat very healthy, you don't have to brush your teeth. Your teeth take care of themselves. Yeah, they really do. It's crazy. Yeah. So, <laughs> but teeth, bad teeth are a big issue for uh, everyone that I see in my assisted living homes practically with Alzheimer's or dementia also has very bad teeth. Yeah. I mean, I can see a, a connection yeah. in my homes. It's not a scientific study, but I'm willing to bet that that's very true. So, well, yeah. so all those things contribute and you can do amazing things when you get people on the right track health wise. Amazing. Well, you're talking about bacteria in the mouth. So what would be the very worst thing you could possibly do when that's the case is throw a bunch of sugar to feed the bacteria. Like, of course, bad things are going to happen and it's going to, it's going to spread. And, and, and yeah, that, that it goes up into the brain is it's crazy, but very true that de the mouth is really like the portal to, to help. Once you see the mouth start to go, other things are going to follow with that. And so if you can stay on top of that, it's so much better. And you're absolutely right. I haven't been to the dentist in like five or six years. I don't really feel like I need to go. They might, my teeth used to be sensitive. Now they feel really strong. I just, you know, do basic stuff to take care of them. And I, I don't eat sugar and carbohydrates and it, it, they really do sort themselves out so much better. Again, what a fantastic story um, about Melissa. We know how dementia affects the person themselves. Not great. We know how it affects the family so much worse. In fact, if I were the family, you know, again, not, not knowing much about ketogenic diets, I would have thought like best case scenario, we're at least slowing down the progression of dementia. I probably would have even thought that there was anything you could do to like actually reverse it. So I'm pretty safe in assuming that all of these people are over the moon with the progress and coming home and the results you've gotten on the caregiving side. What is that like to see a life transformed from somebody who's demented to now like getting their life back and remembering things it must be very touching but also a lot easier to provide care right oh yeah the caregivers are thrilled yeah because you know they deal with people who are incontinent very overweight can't get out of bed you know worried about hurting their back trying to sit people up and now they've got this person who gets up on their own and she was getting in the sauna by herself and getting it all <laughs> set each day. You know, they're like, all I have to do is sit here and make sure they don't get in trouble. It's wonderful. So, um, you know, they're thrilled. And I try to tell them, you know, the more success stories they have, the more of those kind of people we're going to get into the home to take care of. And the easier your job's going to be. So let's work hard at getting these people well enough that they can get home, <laughs> or, or at least you know better. The early, when she was about halfway through her time with us, she was with us about six or seven months to do this. Um, one of her daughters took her out to um, lunch or something like that. It was with her three hours, and when she drove back, she's like mom you didn't forget a single thing we talked about this whole day but <laughs> when she came to us she could barely hold a conversation like she couldn't remember what she just talked about and she's like it's amazing so um you know hearing those kind of stories are just so cool <laughs> That, that is just amazing. I mean, at the end of the day, the caretaker is going to make a paycheck doing whatever they need to do during that day. But at the, at the end of the day, what they're doing it for is to help people. That's why they have that caring gene. They want to see people improve. They, they must feel amazing driving home every single day, knowing that the people that they care for and eventually, I would say, grow to love are having this success. And man, you must sleep real easy at night knowing that you're doing really good business. You're doing whatever it takes to get a ride, regardless of the price of eggs or red meat is at the time. Like you're doing such good work and to have you back on to, to check out some of these stories, revisit a few stories and then tell some of the new ones. Um, it's just absolutely wonderful. We're probably going to have to make this like an annual thing where you're coming back and like talking about everything that's like going on and how this is changing overall. And, and especially with your own health as well. So how I've really enjoyed, oh, go ahead. 
I, I said, I hope to just keep feeding you success stories. <laughs> I don't think they're going to be slowing down anytime soon. And I if people not. want to see this, they really do. Go go to the links. We'll, we'll tag it in the show notes. But make sure you follow Hal and Paradise for Parents on social media so you can actually see it. These people are genuinely happy and feeling better. You see numbers of blood pressure getting better, like all kinds of stuff. It's just absolutely astounding. It's not really surprising if you've been in this world for a while. But um, it's, it's really impressive what you're doing and um, such a gift for these people. So... Hal Kramer, uh, again, such a pleasure to catch up with you and chat again. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Uh, my website is <laughs> aparadise 4 forparents.com. Uh, social media, we're at a Paradise for Parents Assisted Living on Facebook. Uh, my Instagram is Assisted Living Hal Cranmer, although I'm not as good at updating that. And then Hal Cranmer on Twitter seems to be the one I'm, I'm most... I also put together, like a lot of people were asking me to, you know, what can they do at home for your loved one that they're not ready to move into assisted living. So I put together like a little pamphlet of cheap things you can do at home that'll help you ward off dementia. Um, you can go to bringmemoryback.com. And then I, I started sending out like daily emails with just tips and techniques to help elderly people, people with dementia, things like that. It's not medical advice, it's information. We gotta make that disclaimer, but um, I'm trying to, you know, I, I would love for people to get better at home and not have to move into an assisted living. I, I know they have to in many cases, so I'm not gonna go out of business anytime soon, but it would be wonderful to ha help them live the rest of their lives at home because that's what people really wanna do. Yeah, that's amazing. We'll be sure to tag all of that in the notes. So I was going to say, you're not very good at business, but you're really, really good at helping people out and doing things the right way. And yes, you're right. Like, uh, yeah, of course, we're trying to put people, um, you know, put yourself out of business doing what you do. You're, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But in the meantime, you're making some real changes in some of these lives. And so can't thank you enough for everything you've done. I can't thank you enough for coming back on our show today. We really, really appreciate your help. Well, thank you for evangelizing this lifestyle because it's, it needs to get out there. So yep. please keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for having me. We're not slowing down anytime soon. <laughs> well, thanks, dude. It's been an honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.